people don't come to me because they're trying to save money and outsource. If they want to do that, they go to Fiverr, they go to Upwork, they go to online jobs. They want somebody who's cheap and, you know, just to do a quick task. There you go. We're looking to develop long-term relationships and build partnerships to help our clients grow sustainable businesses that actually last. Welcome to the Game Changer Show, helping you win in a decade of disruption. I'm your host, Carmen Wild, and my guest today is Jeff Hunter, known as the Outsourcing King. He's the founder and CEO of VA Staffer, founder of Branded Media, and has a podcast called Savage Marketer. Hunter, Savage, King, this man means business. So Jeff, it's awesome to have you on the show today. <laughs> I'd have to keep that sound bite. That was funny. Thank you for having me on the show. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pleasure. So Jeff, you serve clients literally worldwide. And um, I'd, so I'd, from that perspective, this global perspective, what would you say has been some of the sort of extraordinarily different or tougher challenges you've seen in the last year, especially? Well, I think, you know, obviously we've all had to deal with this whole pandemic thing and, and there's I'm probably going to be a huge sociological change of just how we do business in general. I think it's affected our personal lives as well. You know, now we have, a lot of people vaccinated still walking around outside by themselves in their car with their mask on, you know, like they're just trained, you know, they've been trained and conditioned. Um, so I think we're, we're entering a new age of almost unconditioning ourselves. Right. And even the way that we do business has changed so much, you know, uh, a year and a half ago, we'll say January of 2020, when I told people what I do for a living, that I have a hundred plus, you know, virtual team and I, and I help businesses basically build virtual teams that work remotely in January, 2020, it was like, wow, that's so futuristic. That's so, <laughs> you know what I mean? And now it's like, if you don't have a virtual team, your business has died or suffered traumatically. And now it's finally the stigma and I wrote an, an article on entrepreneur.com about this, but it's, it's literally the stigma of remote work is, is finally done. I think that's the biggest change. I think that you and I are here on Zoom. I'm in my underwear. One thing you, you missed out on, by the way, they call me the underwear entrepreneur. All right. Okay. You've got to stand uh, up and show us. I mean, I'm not, but <laughs> only because I'm not matching. If I was wearing some cute boxers or something that were matching, maybe. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's the truth, you know. And and for me, as as an introvert, you know, a lot of people they think it's kind of funny that I'm an introvert, you know. But uh, I would guess I would consider myself an ambivert now. I'm a trained introvert, you know. I've learned how important it is to be able to to communicate and, and discuss with groups. And, you know, I've, I've spoken on big stages and, um, but I'd rather not to, <laughs> I'd rather not. <laughs> so, yeah, you an introvert. Well, that's, that's interesting. If you're an int introvert, Jeff, then that's a game changer. <laughs> it is. And I think, well, that's the thing. I think working remotely, like, over here, speaking of King, over here, I'm in my, I'm in my office. I'm in my element. It's me by myself. I, I'm allowing you into the space, right? So, like, I have control. For me, it's more more about control. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, in this virtual platform, we we've kind of leveled the playing field. You know, back in the day, the only way to to really do well and be successful is you had to be a people person. Yes. Yeah. I think Mark Zuckerberg has proved you don't have to be a people person to be successful. Exactly. So much has shifted. So tell us, why is having a virtual team a game changer? Well, first off, it, it doesn't limit you 
to only hiring people in your own demographic, in your own vicinity, your own locality, right? So now you can actually attract people to work for you remotely. And you know what? You know what one of my biggest demographics are? Stay-at-home moms. Wow. I love stay-at-home moms because most of them are very overqualified for that job. <laughs> you know, like my wife, she has a degree. She went to college for 10 years, but we decided to have kids and she's been at home, right? For eight years. We have an eight-year-old, almost nine. So, you know, there's a lot of women who are entering the workforce at record numbers. As a matter of fact, they've shown that, you know, there's more women working than men right now. <laughs> That's interesting. Most of the people on my team are women. I'd say probably 75 to 80% of the people on my team are women. And most of them are stay-at-home moms. Mm -hmm. And they're in the Philippines because there's an incredible opportunity right now worldwide to hire people based on not only, you know, their skill level, but, you know, it's a great opportunity for us as business owners to, uh, to actively seek out to do really good change in the world. And, you know, for me, I'm able to offer people two, three times more than what they're getting paid in the Philippines to come and work for me to do something that they actually love. And I train them how to do it instead of them just, you know, getting paid you know, nine dollars a day or whatever it is in the Philippines. It's absolutely horrible, actually. So mm -hmm. it's a game changer, Be better cost, you know, better access to talent. Um, no office overhead. You don't have to buy the big computer internet and this and that. And, you know, just space in general is very hard to come across right now. So. And Jeff, are you offering the service as, I mean, I, I've, I have had a virtual assistant experience and it was actually amazing. Um, but are you finding that you're helping people scale their businesses and the virtual teams are permanent virtual teams or are they sort of flexi hours uh, give us an idea of how things have shifted for some companies well i can tell you this i don't hire anybody part-time because whenever you whenever you hire someone part-time that usually means that you're not their full-time priority right mm -hmm. so whether you hire people in person or remote i would always suggest make sure that you have someone who's actually committed and dedicated to you that hasn't changed so that definitely hasn't changed with the culture. Um, but on the other question that you pose, you know, this is a permanent thing. Um, you know, they're not coming and going. This is a, a digital transformation of how we do work. You know, like I have a Zoom call every morning at 9 a.m. with my project management, and my leadership team. Um, we talk about, you know, I have 100 and almost 50 people on my team right now. So we have a we have design, we have a creatives team, we have a copywriting team. You know, we have a web design team. We have, we have 10 squads, okay? Uh -huh. Each of our executive assistant teams are broken down into squads of about 10 to 12. So we have 10 squads that each of them have a squad leader. So that's kind of like a middle, middle management position. So, you know, I, I build things out for long-term and growth. Uh, and the businesses that I help build and scale their teams, they need to have solid permanent teams because the only way to it's hard to grow sustainably if you're building a team that's going to quit you know in the technology sector right now the average tenure for an employee for a team member in technology is 1.8 years imagine investing all that time into somebody and then after 1.8 years they leave right so this is why I believe what I'm doing with the virtual teams, especially building out what I'm doing in the Philippines, man, I want to make sure that people love their job and they stay forever. You know, I've been in business doing this for seven years now. I can tell you seven years in this industry is a lot. And of course I'd get a Facebook call right now, right? <laughs> there it is. Um, but seven years in this industry is, is huge. Uh, it's almost eight years actually. So wow. looking back on it, like it's, I've, I've had to hire probably 300, 400 people to get to the 150 people that I have right mm -hmm. now. Um, our recruitment process is unlike any other. If anybody wants to learn anything on this, on this show, 
it would be, you have to be very stringent. You have to be very diligent on the, the way that you hire people. You have to make sure that the people that are coming in, that this is something that aligns with their end goal. What's their end goal? You know, that's how I'm able to retain talent for so long. How can I make what I'm doing align with what they want to do in life? Hmm. And that's a super important thing that I think companies are going to have to learn, especially to attract and retain virtual talent. For sure. So do you help with that process? So I approach you. I need a virtual team. Um, do I give you my brief and you go and search or is it from your existing pool? Or how, how does it work? So the first thing that we do with a client is we go through something that we call the freedom plan. And the freedom plan helps break up what they actually need to get done, what they need to get delegated, right? It's all about delegation. So we look at like the easiest thing to get off your plate would be like repetitive tasks, like payroll, right? Like accounting, like taking your meeting minutes. So every time I have a business call with a client, I have a virtual assistant. Her name's Isabel. She comes on my calls and she literally listens and she takes notes and she records the action items, what we discussed, opportunities, challenges, right? And then she follows up. Like that's something that happens three or four times a day when I have calls, right? So that's a repetitive task. Um, and then there's other different categories of things that we look into to figure out like what is the actual type of help they need. Sometimes it's more than one person, you know? Um, but, but we try to figure out in a systematic way, like what are the things that you need to get off your plate? And then we are constantly recruiting and hiring at VA Staffer. So we hire about 20 people uh, a month you know, um, a matter of fact, I was just, <laughs> I just got a message from my HR person who told me she went through 186 applications and she did 13 interviews and she's going to invite 10 of them to be trainees. So, and by the way, our interview process, our recruitment process is experiential. So to even to even get to an interview, you have to already prove yourself pretty darn good, right? So we're constantly recruiting, trying to find top talent. And here's the thing. This is, some, this is something that blows people's minds. Even though we're a virtual assistant agency, we don't hire virtual assistants. We hire technical support reps. We hire people that are, you know, higher level customer service representatives people that have already got a track record of working in an English setting where they're speaking either American English or Australian English um, or, you know, South African <laughs> or whatever, you know, whatever. typically most of the clients are in America. Um, so it's, we, you know, that, that American English is, is pretty valuable to us. Um, and we like people that already have a track record of, you know, solving really good problems, like figuring things out. We don't want just drones that read a call script. We want people that are good at technical support and things like that. And then we train those people how to become virtual assistants. <laughs> so that's the trick. So back to your question, uh, you know, uh, every business is different, but it all comes down to, you know, very, it comes down to the fundamentals, which is, Every business has the same type of things that need to be done. Um, and we train our team on the basics of business that 99% of entrepreneurs, CEOs, and businesses need help with. That way, everything else that they teach them is a bonus, right? Okay, so, so you, you're helping me recruit. you finding experienced people, um, you already have done quite a, a filtering process to, to narrow it down. Um, you're giving them extra training. And um, literally, I'm going to get someone that's going to be able to hit the ground running. And from an HR perspective, do you handle all the HR type things, leave and all that stuff? Yeah. So we do all the payment. We do all the training. We do, we even do cross training. So like, for example, if a virtual assistant has a baby, which just happened by the way, a few times, I think we just, just 
it must be that time of the year because I think we just had three people go on leave to have a baby. So what we do is we actually have a replacement trained up to cover that person while they're out. Um, I started a baby bonus at the company. Um, mm -hmm. So anytime, you know, somebody has a baby, basically I give them a paid two week off, you know, to do what they need to do. And by the way, the husbands as well, oh. the men and women, that's a baby bonus oh. for the men and women. Um, so, you know, and, uh, you know, by the way, that's very important to me because one of the reasons I did that is because I used to work in the corporate world and my wife and I, we had two babies, um, while I was working in the corporate world. The first one, Jesse, who is turning nine next month. And, uh, when he was born, my wife had a very complicated birth. She was in labor for like 48 hours. <laughs> oh, um, that's and I had a lot going on at work and I didn't really have a replacement. So mm -hmm. I couldn't be there the way that I wanted to be. And, uh, and the second one ended up being a miscarriage mm -hmm. and uh, trying not to get too emotional here, <clears throat> but it was a very hard time emotionally and physically. And I was not able to take time off to be with my wife and it scarred her. And I thought in my life, I said, wow, you know, like, they don't really care about me, you know, and I never wanted to be that guy. As a matter of fact, just yesterday, I implemented a new, a new uh, birthday policy that people will also get their birthday off. Now, they just have to train a replacement for the day and get a week worth of approval. And I want to give everybody the opportunity to celebrate another year on this earth. And that's what's cool about being a CEO. See, we get to make our own rules, right? Oh, so if it's, there's, a little, there's a little bit of that. We do all that stuff. Yeah. And you know, that to me, what you've just shared with us there, the bringing that humanity into business and giving your virtual team members, this opp these opportunities, that to me is a game changer. I want to make this the best, most amazing place to work at. And I want my team to know that they're valued. And I want my team to know that I care about them. And I want them to never feel the way that I did when I worked in a corporation that didn't care about me. Mm. No, that's, that's rare. And I can just only imagine what the energy is like in your team. I mean, as a, as a high performance business coach, being in the high performance space over two decades, it takes something to create what you're creating. And when you get it right, it's intoxicating. And what I, what I love about what you're saying is you're not only serving your own business, but every single person that hires virtual staff through you, they are coming into a team with this kind of culture. They're experiencing something different because of what you're setting up for the, 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 the conditions and, and the, the package, etc. the benefits that you're giving. Um, so many business owners are now experiencing in their businesses because so what you're creating is an incredible ripple effect, and uh, that's that's really special. I hope I hope your virtual team is going to be treated as well with the people you're placing them with. <laughs> we are very selective of the people that ah, we work with, fantastic. and on both sides, right? So <clears throat> we have a very interesting pre-qualification method. This is a game changer too. <laughs> so first off, our demand is so high right now that we have about a two to three week lead time just to become a client of ours. And people are paying two, three weeks in advance knowing that they're not gonna have service for two to three weeks, right? Um, and the reason why is because we're very selective of our people. We have, I, I don't really market or advertise the company outside of coming on podcasts and shows like this and talking about the team because 
you know, our biggest growth is actually from our own client base. Mm -hmm. Our clients refer all of their friends and family and coworkers and other business owners to us. Just last week, we had someone refer 10 people to us, 10. Wow. Um, so our calendar, even just the, the, our, we offer a free strategy call, even our strategy call calendar is sometimes, you know, seven to 10 days booked out just to get a strategy call with us. I'm not proud about that, by the way, I'd love to do that, but see, we don't focus on sales. We only have one person who does inbound sales and, you know, I don't know if I, you know, just because of the, the rate that we hire in the house how picky we are at hiring our people, you know, we can only grow by say 10 to 20 new clients a month. So it kind of works out, you know? Mm. And I know it's, it's hard as an entrepreneur, but we do kind of get comfortable with our growth. <laughs> you know, we're a million dollar company. We have a hundred people and it just, right now, I just feel like if all I focused on is just the quality of my team and the quality of my clients, everything else has been seeming to fall into place. Yeah, well, it does because you're focusing on the right things. And that's why everything else, it flows. You know, when you're focusing on quality and values, business flows as it should. So give us a story <laughs> of a client that, that hired maybe more like a whole team perhaps and how that shifted their business totally man some of them some of them are more open to me sharing stories than others um you i don't know exactly how much i can no, you don't speak have about this one. Name. <laughs> one i'll give you i'll give you a story about <clears throat> his name's arnie giski and he runs a 70,000 person Facebook group called, uh, it's basically the Millennial Entrepreneur Community, MEC. And this is a beautiful story because, so we offer two different things because uh, when you introduced me, you talked about VA Staffer, you also talked about branded media. And by the way, even though they're different companies, they're ran by the same people, mm -hmm. right? So they just have different focuses. So the virtual assistant company helps, helps people build reliable, consistent virtual teams. Branded media is a branding agency. So we create, you know, social media content. We do video editing. We do websites, you know, things like that, like business building stuff. So we have the support and the building, right? And that's the whole point behind Savage Marketer. <laughs> is we do the marketing side of the business and we do the support. So he came to me um, and he needed a virtual assistant to help manage a Facebook group because it has too many people. And since then, he's actually worked with us on the branding side as well to help build websites, do graphic design, do social media, things like that. And to the point to where he has about, I think, four full-time people that work for him for his main company, like in the States. And then he has access to one dedicated virtual assistant. And then he also leverages our like graphic designers and web designers and stuff on an hourly basis. And he actually did something truly amazing a few weeks ago. And he bought a brand new, like, top of the line gaming laptop for his virtual assistant in the Philippines. We're talking probably like, you know, a $1,300 like gaming laptop, like it's really nice, right? And these are the types of relationships that we build with our clients and our team members. And matter of fact, her name's, her name's Michael. I was just talking to her last night. And I said, hey, how's the new computer? And she goes, oh my gosh, boss, it's so great. I love, you know, and, and that's the culture. It goes back to what you said earlier. It, it's the culture. And, you know, we have a client, Nations Lending, who I think they just hired the 25th person through us. They're our, they're our biggest client. We have appointment setters for them, people that do outbound calls. We do lead generation, people that are going out and finding people for the people to call. 
We have dedicated assistance for their leadership team. Um, we have marketing assistants that help create flyers and banners and things for real estate agents. I mean, we do so many different things and that's, what's really cool. Like when you, when you, when you first have that aha moment that you could build a virtual team, mm -hmm. like finding out all the different things that you could have people do and recruiting the right talent. Now they're coming to us, asking us to recruit some project managers for them. Right. So I see myself as a trusted partner to help build sustainable teams for businesses that are in growth scale. You know, like people don't come to me because they're trying to save money and outsource. If they want to do that, they go to Fiverr, they go to Upwork, they go to online jobs. They want somebody who's cheap and, you know, just to do a quick task. There you go. We're looking to develop long-term relationships and build partnerships to help our clients grow sustainable businesses that actually last. Mm. I like it. Really like the, the model. So you spoke about a hub and a spoke something in terms <laughs> of proofing your business. What is that? <laughs> Tell me. So a hub and spoke model, if you can imagine a bicycle wheel, right? And in the middle of that wheel is the hub. And then you see all the spokes that go out and support the outer side of the tire. Well, that's kind of the new business model for most companies now is online is the hub, the virtual meeting place now is some sort of a project management tool. It's some sort of portal, right? It could be a Zoom call in the morning, like we have a 9 a.m. call with all eight of the people on my team, um, on the leadership team. So we discuss, you know, what's the priorities, what are any issues that we've got, stuff like that. Um, and then pretty much everyone is kind of on their own little island. And that's the hub and spoke. So, you know, and another thing, too, is if you look at it, if you have an in-person office, which by the way is, there's nothing wrong with having an in-person office, by the way, I'm not anti-office. I'm just saying that with a hub and spoke type model, you can have an office and you can have people that work remotely as well, right? So you have your main office. And for me, it's right here in California in my house. This is our hub right here. This is where most of the business is done, but guess what? The hub is also moving, right? That's why I want you to visualize the bicycle, because if the bicycle's going down the street in San Diego, it's still the hub, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so we have this new flexible model now to where, where business can operate wherever you are. Mm -hmm. But here's the catch. You have to have the right mindset and culture. Otherwise, people can drift, drift away. The, 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 you know, the, the bike could end up on Hun Huntington Beach, mm -hmm. you know. And if you're at Huntington Beach, if you know, you're just chilling, right? Um, the, the last thing you want to do is have a team that's unaccountable. So you have to think about accountability measures. And that's one of the things that I guess in my past life, I was a project manager for a Fortune 500 company. So, you know, measuring productivity and, and accountability is super important. And I think that that's an advantage that I have coming into the entrepreneurial world. Um, a lot of people have a hard time. They struggle understanding how to keep the accountability, reliability, the, the responsiveness of remote teams. If you can get those kind of dialed in, boy, you have a recipe that it would just blow anything away. Because you know what? People will even take a pay cut to be able to work from home, right? So, and like I said, you're able to attract an odd, uh, uh, you know, a demographic of people like stay-at-home moms who they can't take a job that goes, they have to leave at eight o'clock in the morning to go to the office and get there by nine. And then you've got a clock out at four o'clock. And then, you know, like they have to pick up their kids. They have to take them to school in the morning. Right. So I don't, for me personally, I, going back to what you said in the very beginning, you said, is it flexible hours? Is it dedicated hours? Well, most of the time it's dedicated hours, but if, as long as they're doing what they need to do, it's results-based, I could really care less. Yeah. For me personally, I have three people that work directly for me, direct report to me. Isabel, my main assistant, 
she works from about two hours before I wake up until like a little after my lunch. And then I have Tr uh, Tristan who comes in at one o'clock and one o'clock until, you know, the afternoon he, he, you know, he, he supports me. And then right before I go to sleep, Karen comes online and she manages my social media presence on TikTok and, and LinkedIn and all that kind of stuff. So I have three people that actually work for me pretty much around the clock so that I'm always present. Wow. Oh. That sounds, what, what you've described is a complete departure from the way we think, the way we used to build our work environments. We're literally almost having to, and I mean, this goes without saying in every aspect of our lives, we have to literally unlearn everything. And, and, and step completely into a new space and be willing to learn and grow and, and, and find a new way. What you're speaking about though, Jeff, I mean, there's so many benefits and, and it's, it's awesome. As you were speaking, um, I'm hearing more and more and more reasons why rather than not to um, attempt this and how, how the flexibility, moving all over the show changes, it's certainly going to future-proof your business to well, have some people virtual. Here's a personal example. Uh, June 26th, uh, so I, I just went out crazy on a whim, and I went and bought a 36-foot motorhome. Okay. And on June 26th, I will be taking my family on a month-long road trip around America. We're going from California here starting. We're going all the way out to Florida which is literally on the other side. <laughs> it feels like the other side of the world. America is so big, right? <laughs> um, and lo and behold, I'm going to be able to work. And um, we live in a, in a very amazing time. You yeah. know, like, mm -hmm. I wish my grandfather was alive today. <laughs> you know, he was the one who inspired me. That's why I go by Jeff J. Hunter. Um, the J stands for Jesse, my middle name, which is actually my grandfather's name. And uh, he was a huge inspiration to me. He told me very, very young, and I didn't really understand it, that only dummies work hard. <laughs> and, <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> right? Yeah. He, he, said, he said that, he says that all the education that I get inside the books would never be enough that I would always have to self-educate things that aren't in the books. Otherwise I'd be ending up doing what everyone in the books did. Mm. And that didn't make sense to me in, until probably in my mid thirties when I just looking back on it, you know, Oh man, I don't want to get emotional again, but the last thing that my grandfather said to me before he passed away, um, it was actually in 2016, I had quit my corporate job to dedicate building out the rest of this team for VA Stafford. And I took my wife, my three-year-old kid at the time, to the Philippines for an entire month. And I felt, I didn't know if I should go because my grandfather was literally on his deathbed. And he looked at me and he said, hurry back. And I said, I don't, you know, like looking back, I didn't know he was on his, I didn't know he was going to die. So I didn't understand what he meant because he grabbed my shirt. <clears throat> but then I said, do you want me to go? You know, should I do this or, or should I stay? And he looked at me and he said, don't be waiting around here for me to die. Mm -hmm. Wanted me to make something out of myself. And I can tell you right now, this business would not have been built if it wasn't for him. I wouldn't be successful. <clears throat> I remember when I got my very first job interview, <laughs> I didn't even have a suit. 
and my grandfather took me out to the men's warehouse and he bought me a buy one, get one free suit deal. <laughs> and it was just a cheap $300 suit, you know, but damn, I felt like a million bucks. Uh-huh. And I nailed that interview. <laughs> and uh, I'm just so grateful that, you know, a kid who grew up poor, who my dad worked at a car wash and my mom was on welfare. I'm able to impact so many lives. And I've brought in over 100 people out of horrible poverty, worse than poverty conditions in the Philippines. And I want everyone on my team to reach all their potential. And I want to be seen as a partner in their success. And that's, that's what motivates me. Oh. And I'm sure I can feel it. And I'm sure I have no doubt they feel it. And thank you to Granddad Jesse for inspiring you and um, giving you that, that inspiration that you needed to um, not be a dummy and work hard so you could become the outsourcing king. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Jeff, I asked you to, to think about a powerful message um, that's had a profound impact on you. And um, I, I'd love for you to give us, drop us your game changer wisdom in, in 60 seconds. You know, I think that everything that we do in life, every relationship we create, they're always transactional in the beginning. I would say if there's anything that I would look back on and learn is that you have to really invest in those relationships and whatever value that someone thinks they're going to get out of that transaction, whether it's time, whether it's energy, whether it's money, whether it's results, overproduce, like give them more than what they're expecting because that sets the stage. Because if you underperform, if somebody's expecting something and you give them less, then that sets the stage for the rest of your relationship that you will underperform. And that's a horrible place to be in life, to be the person that somebody thinks isn't giving them value. And that goes with personal relationships, you know, your spouse, your, your boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, your kids. Um, it's super important, your mom, your dad. You know, I surprised my dad yesterday. My mom is the the breadwinner in the family. She's a nurse. He actually put her through nursing school, you know, on a five minute car wash salary. Hmm. But yesterday, my dad told me that his car broke down. Well, he sent a group chat to everyone. And he says that he's going to work on getting his old car fixed up. It's 1980 something, whatever. I called him and I said, hey, dad, I need your help on something. <laughs> I need someone to take me in, follow behind me to take my motor home to a te technician to work on it, the mechanic. He says, okay. So he follows me in the RV and we go and we take the, uh, the RV and then we, we drive back in, in this other car that I've got. It's an old car. And when we were done, I gave him the keys. I said, hey, thanks. He says, are you going to take me home? And I said, why don't you take yourself home? Here's the keys. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> right? Oh. I mean, it's not a Lexus or anything, but to him, it's, it's a car. Yeah. yeah. Amazing that you can give those gifts to. And you know what? He cried. Oh. <laughs> and he was like, I didn't ask for this. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and even though it was like a two thousand dollar car, you know, that it just meant so, it meant so much to him, right? Exactly. Because I was thinking about him. So the moral of the story is it doesn't take a lot of money yeah. to make people happy yeah. and give them more than they expect. Yeah. So always give people more than they expect from you. That's my that's my nugget. Fantastic. But Jeff, you, you, get in, you get around. I mean, apart from you doing, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of travel hours, which, which we haven't even 
touched on. You're getting around in an RV, you having clients all around the world and staff all around the world, etc. So you've got your ear to the ground. Can you share a game changer alert for us? So to your mind, what would you say is a threatening disruption you foresee that we need to be aware of? Something that's scary. And then a really exciting one that we should be leveraging. Well, you're in luck. The scary one is also the exciting one. Uh -huh. So the 60 seconds from before, we got a two for here. Um, we're, in a, we're in a bubble phase. You know, the real estate market, it's ugly. Um, I don't know when it's going to fall, but it's going to fall, you know, and I wouldn't say that if I wasn't 100% confident with it. Um, and I think the other, the, the, the reason why I says a twofer is because inflation is super, super high. And that's the reason why a lot of the housing prices are high. It's why damn near all the pricing is high on everything right now. Um, so I think that we're going to be looking at different monetary uh, ways. I think that the new cryptocurrency, um, you know, craze is, is going to be around forever. I don't see it going anywhere. I, I don't think it's a fad. I think that more people are catching on to it. I feel like there's still so many people in this world who don't use cryptocurrency that it's going to drive the price up even higher. Um, I was a very late adopter, you know, I was very skeptic, but now looking at the monetary policies, not only here in America, but around the world, I think that people have lost trust in the monetary system. Mm -hmm. I feel that we live in a very interesting time and here we are. We are most of our call today was about the virtual age. And I would just say to start preparing a lot of your physical assets to be virtual. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. So you've hit on a start there, which is, which is what I was going to ask you next. As a, as a game changer, who re I mean, you're supporting entrepreneurs all the time and you're helping them grow and scale their businesses. But we're also in a decade of mass disruption where not everybody is fortunate enough to be in a position to grow in scale. They're just still trying to hold on to how can I just maintain what I have or, or, or not lose? So with that in mind, what would you say, what would be your best advice for entrepreneurs? Like, guys, you have to start this right now. If you're not doing this, start right now. And if you're still doing this, stop if you want to win in a decade of disruption. Right now, you're going to have to focus on the relationships. You know, like that's the number one thing it is growing and building relationships. And it used to be the six degrees, of, you know, the eight degrees of separation, six degrees of separation. Now it's like one degree, like somebody that you know, yeah. know somebody that will change your life. Yeah. You know, like the world has gotten so small now. So, you know, like a lot of people are not intentional in the relationships that they build. Um, I, I've been very fortunate the last couple of years. I've built very intentional relationships, um, you know, with people that that are that can really help me in my life. And I build relationships with them without ever expecting anything in return. Right. But I know that I'm building that reputation with them and that when when all hits the fan okay you're gonna be stuck with the people that you surround yourself with so if you're gonna go down the abyss <laughs> you better start planning the team that you want to go down with <laughs> so okay get those relationships intact and what's I'm sure you'll attest to this because this has been a game changer surprise in the last year for probably many people. You can build these relationships digitally. I know more people in the last, more new people in the last year digitally that I count almost as family and friends now, and I've never met them in person. Um, 
it's incredible what what this like you said the world got so small so and that's exactly it you know like that's one of the reasons why i started my podcast savage marketer you know it was I'll throw the Savage Marketer hat on. There it is. <laughs> yeah. The Savage Marketer podcast was my tool to build relationships with people that I want to meet. Yeah. I leveraged the podcast and said, hey, man, you're doing re really crazy things. I'd love to have you on the show and talk about what's going on. And it's been a great avenue for me to build relationships with people that, I would, that would never give me the, the time of day, yeah. you know? And even become mentors. You know, I've had people become mentors of mine, you know, like uh, Doug Harrison, who was behind, you know, the happiness campaign for Coca-Cola. If you've ever seen a penguin and a polar bear drinking a Coke <laughs> and you know, like that's the guy is epically famous. He's worked for everyone. Microsoft, Amazon, you know, Disney, um, IBM, like he's he's done so many huge campaigns and he was he helped me come up with my own branding method for my agency. And like, like I would, you know, like you, I, you, I wouldn't have been able to afford him, yeah. you know, it's because I build a relationship with him mm. and um, you know, I gotta be better with my relationships too. There's definitely been relationships that either, you know, with COVID-19, I'll have to admit it's definitely killed some relationships. Ones that were built like in person but just like you said, you can build relationships with people digitally. You can support them. You can engage with them. You can show them that you actually care. Yes. I call it give a damn, you yes. know? <laughs> so show people that you give a damn and, and live your life from a place of servitude. And it's amazing how the world, how the universe or God or whatever you believe in will give it back, yeah. especially when you're not doing it to get things back. The more good you put out in the world, the more good that comes back to you. Oh, sure. And, with you with that one. <laughs> and look, by the way, you know, a lot of people that put out amazing things, bad things happen to. Yeah. You know, bad, bad things happen to good people. But, exactly. But see, at the end of the day, I can sleep at night knowing that I've gone and done everything that I can to make this world a better place. And I know that sounds really cheese ball, but like, it feels good, man. Like I, I, I would love to pretend and say that I'm altruistic. I'm not, I do it because it makes me feel good. You know, I do feel great when I do good things for people. And other people are feeling good too. So um, it's a win-win-win for, for everybody involved. So what would be the stop? You got to stop. You know, I think a lot of people are trying too hard to become influencers. You know, like they're not focused on the value they create. They're focused on how many people value them. You know, how many people see their stuff, you know, like, it, and, it, and it's sad because society almost rewards it. So you have to go like against the grain of culture. Like people do anything for attention, you know? So like, don't focus on the eyeballs, focus on the quality. Um, it's ironic coming from me. Cause I, you know, on my TikTok, I've gotten hundreds of millions of views on my TikTok account, but, um, and I do stupid things, which is why which is why I have millions of views, <laughs> but, um, you know, try to do things with more intent and purpose mm -hmm. and, and just stop, you know, stop wasting your time posting on social media, you know, things that, that don't matter or, or posting stuff where people aren't. And, you know, I, I feel like so many people waste money on things that, and time and energy, right. On, on things that don't actually drive their business. And, uh, just one last thing I would remember for everyone listening that everything that you do is either building or destroying your brand, right? Every interaction, every time someone sees what you're up to, you see they're hurting your image or it's helping your image. So you just have to think about the things that are hurting your image and stop them. And by the way, I'm guilty. I, I still do some of that stuff too, but it's a never ending quest. Thank you.
what I've heard you say for, for the last little while is be savagely real. You do have to be authentic, you know? Yeah. And I think you have to stop looking at your competitors, you yeah. know? Like, stop looking at your competitors. Stop, stop caring about anyone else. You know, I guess that was the thing that I learned back in high school and college. I was a competitive swimmer. And, uh, you know, that, that saying, stay in your lane, yeah. you know, when you're a swimmer, it really applies because you have a strip, a lane. Yes. You're not against these other people on the side. You're against the water in your lane, mm. <laughs> right? The water is your enemy. <laughs> so you've got to run your own race. And the moment that you focus on yourself and how you can be better, if we were just 1% better every day, right? Just 1% better than the day before, you'd be exponentially better at the end of the year. For sure. Thank you for your realness, the rawness and the, the authenticity. And it's been an amazing hour to share with you. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, it's my pleasure. Jeff mentioned it earlier. Um, we're actually in, a, in exciting times. Flip and scary, but it's exciting too. And we can absolutely ride this wave of disruption. But there's one caveat. We have to do it together. And that's what this show is all about. It's about winning together. And the more that we can bring our beautiful heads together and win together, we are absolutely going to blast right into the next decade playing the game. So thanks for watching. Be sure to hit subscribe if you're not subscribed yet. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>